We all want faster internet speeds. How else can I stream Westworld on HBO Go while my children are watching YouTube videos about stuff getting crushed by hydraulic presses? Mm -hmm. Amen. But, I know. That, that's why we need them. But... Mm -hmm. Now that so many schools depend on internet access in the classroom, the disparity of internet speeds can create a lot bigger and long-lasting problems than buffering video at home. Joining us to talk about this is Dan Runcy, Engagement Manager at Education Superhighway, an organization that helps districts and states improve internet connectivity in schools. Welcome, Dan. Hey, Megan. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for coming on. So tell us what Education Superhighway does and how you got involved. Great. So Education Superhighway is a nonprofit organization. We're based in San Francisco, and our goal is to help upgrade the internet access for public schools across the country. We realized four years ago that there was a big gap between the haves and have nots for digital learning and what students can do with digital learning, the type of opportunities that they can get in the future. But broadband access itself was a big barrier to that. And schools being able to have the networking infrastructure to provide that access, that's just something that isn't there. So what our goal as an organization is, is specifically trying to bridge the gap, work with school districts, work with state leaders across the country, but also work with the service provider community. We see ourselves as the link to help make connectivity a reality for all students, regardless of where they live. So now you uh, say you were the first person in your family uh, to be born in the United States. And, um, and so when it came, came time for you to apply to college, uh, you couldn't get the help at home. So talk a little bit about how internet access really uh, leveled the playing field for you. Yeah, for me, having access to the internet gave me more information than I would have been able to get otherwise. When I was applying to college, I entered ninth grade, I still remember folks started talking about college and my teacher started mentioning it as well. And although my parents and I and my you know older brother and stuff, we had a good understanding, but I knew that I needed to get a broader context than what I had. So the internet was able to level the playing field. I can still remember the days in ninth grade, 10th grade, going to the library in school, looking through the Princeton Review website, looking through the college board websites as well, and identifying which schools were the best in terms of academic rigor, which schools had the best culture. And that helped me narrow down a list of the schools that I wanted to visit. And I was able to use that and also meet with my guidance counselors, meet with teachers. So I was able to augment and create a lot of my own learning through that way. And this is your day talking about 15 years ago. So having that level of foundation and then bringing that to um, where I was by the time I was a senior, ready to visit schools, ready to apply, I had a pretty firm understanding. And if I didn't have the internet access, it would have taken me years to be able to do that. I would have had to you know, look through all of the um, large books and books that are in the libraries, or I would have had to ask around and it's tough. So that's one example of how it leveled the playing field for me. And like I said, this is 15 years ago. So if you're just thinking about where internet access is now and the opportunities that are available now through streaming, through video, it, it makes a big difference. So um, what what exactly is the biggest challenge for schools right now when it comes to internet access? Is it is it, you know, just the idea of the, the pipes not being too big, to use a horrible metaphor? Um, or is it, you know, that, that student requirements now require, like, uh, their heavy bandwidth requirements? You know, it's not just docs and, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest challenge now is, is the infrastructure, but it's the reasons and the access that schools themselves individually can have to get it. Because right now, it's largely built up in areas that are more urban and more densely populated. That's where people are, that's where the businesses are, and that's where the organizations are that have it. So if a service provider or a broadband provider wants to bring fiber to a particular community, it's going to cost them several hundred thousand dollars. That's just the way it costs in terms of, you know, specking out and digging up the ground in order to bring fiber to those places. But that makes sense for an urban area. But if you're talking about rural pockets in the country where not a lot of folks live, that can be a bit more challenging. So when school districts themselves are, the, in many cases, one of the principal buyers of that, that's a large bill that they have to foot themselves if they're to do it. So it's bringing, it's merging the economic reality of broadband infrastructure and how that's affecting students that don't live in areas that may have access to that. So right now, we do see a gap between 
those students that live in urban areas versus those students that live in rural areas and the amount of uh, broadband that they're able to have. So we talk a lot about, oh, well, is it better to have iPads in schools or is it better to have Chromebooks? And, you know, but really what all of these devices are helping students uh, with is individualized learning, which is proven mm -hmm. uh, to uh, offer better, more vibrant education to people. So, so how does the technology help uh, the students that you've seen with individualized learning? The technology I've seen, and I've seen it in a few different schools, can make a big difference. Um, there's a school right in the Bay Area here, uh, Summit Shasta. I visited it as part of this um, education pioneers program I did two years ago. And each student, and I repeat, each student in that school, it was a high school, had their own personalized learning plan. This is something that is adapted based on their own skills, their own interests and opportunities. So when they're venturing and they're trying to learn about um, whether it's their algebra homework or if they're trying to take a tour of a certain area in the world that they might not have access to or want to learn about, that opportunity is given to them. They can create that so you have a twofold opportunity. On one hand, they're able to get something that's catered to their skills, but they're also able to get something that's catered to their interest as well. And we all know that when students are more interested and more bought in, it creates a more promising outcome. Because before that, and before that, where a lot of schools are, and the way that was traditionally when I was growing up, those students that fall in the middle, those are the ones that are targeted, those are the ones that may get the services they need, but those that may be on the extreme outliers, one case or another, may not necessarily get the may not necessarily get the, um, the type of learning opportunities that they might have. And by having the access to the internet that improves the platform ability of what each school district has, what each, um, each classroom has in terms of what they can provide to the students, it, 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 I've seen it make a big difference for those schools, especially in the Bay Area. So I think the reality is if everyone can have that at some point, I think you'll see more buying from students as well and more interest from them too. So talk a little bit about E-Rate uh, and how it was broken and needed to be fixed by the Connect Ed initiative. Right. So E-Rate is this program that's been in, um, that's been structured for around 20 years now. And it started by the FCC. And it is an annual fund that provides discounts for internet access services. Hmm. So historically, you think about back in 1996, this is back in the days of dial-up modems. This was back in the days of plugging out the telephone cord and plugging it into your computer to connect to the internet. And all that's great because that's where we're able to get the access from. And the amount of funding that it was able to give was rather substantial at the time too, over $2 billion. If we fast forward 18 years though, to the middle of 2014, the fund looked very similar to what it looked like back then. So one of the things that, um, President Obama did in 2013, the year before that, was started this Connect Ed initiative. And the goal of the Connect Ed initiative said that by the year 2018, we wanna make sure that 99% of the schools in the country are connected to broadband internet access. And Obama, or President Obama called on the FCC specifically because they are the ones that control the E-rate funding. And E-rate funding itself provides funding on average for around a 60 to 70% discount on all of the internet access services that a school district has. So they're the ones that provide annually to this fund, but we all know that if we're able to help structure the funding that a particular school, we were able to restructure the funding source, then we can make the access itself more affordable down the road. So if school districts wants to build fiber out, then it is much more advantageous and much, makes much more economic sense for them to do that now. If the states themselves want to play a part and help the school districts do that, the FCC will be willing to match a certain amount of money and help make that a reality. So they've taken great steps in the past few years to make it more advantageous for districts to overcome some of those economic challenges that we mentioned in the past and hopefully get the broadband infrastructure that they need. Thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Where can people find out more about the, uh, the about what your work online and about the Education Superhighway? To find out more about the work we're doing, visit our website, educationsuperhighway.org. We have information on the projects uh, that we're working on and our history as a company and what our goals are moving forward. More specifically, if folks want to see 
with what their specific school districts in their area or in their neighboring area are paying for internet access or how much their um, how much bandwidth they're getting, they should go to another one of our websites called Compare and Connect K12 org. That's a tool that we call our Kayak or our Expedia for internet access. They can go to, they can type in the name of their school district and see how much that how much that cost or how much that service compares to other school districts around them and hopefully use that information to get a better deal uh, for themselves. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. <laughs> and Dan also is at danrunsey.com. He didn't plug himself, but that's where you can find in more information about Dan. Thanks so <laughs> Thank much you, for Dan. coming on. Great. Thank you. Take, Appreciate it. Yeah, best of <laughs> Take luck. Take care.